Welcome to the Futurist Society podcast, where we delve into the latest advancements in technology, science, and culture. From discussions on the latest breakthroughs in AI, biotechnology, and space exploration, the Futurist Society is your window into all of the awesomeness that the future holds. Get ready to be informed and inspired as we consider the positive impact of emerging technologies on humanity. Without further ado, welcome your host, Dr. Awesome. Welcome back to the Futurist Society, where we are talking in the present, but talking about the future. We have today Howard Rosen, who's a really interesting guy. He has currently been working in the healthcare space and doing a lot of innovation, but he's got a very rich and diverse background, pushing new technologies, pushing futurism. And Howard, why don't you start in giving your your history, because you've had a history in the television business and you know the defense department contracting business and now you're you're pushing the future forward tell us a little bit about how you got to the healthcare industry and and all the different things that you're doing sure that'd be great well thank you so much and it's, a, it's an honor to be part of this podcast it's uh it's really kind of it's a lot of fun to listen to and insightful hope this fits that mold as well so the quick story because there is a bit longer one is by education, I have an MBA in international finance and marketing. So it's trained to run a Fortune 500 company. Um, I have to admit, I didn't attend all my classes, uh, particularly the one that said you don't go from graduation to running a Fortune 500 company. So with my profound disappointment, naturally, I my next move was to go into uh, a career of producing film and television for about 20 years um, with a, a, a number of productions, uh, both as a TV and film. And of course, naturally, with that background, I would fall into an idea that I had come, I came up, I sort of came up with in around 2005, I guess. It's almost 20 years ago now, holy mackerel. Um, which was helped it bet in terms of the healthcare, in terms of how to better engage patients and clinicians. And uh, there is a story on that bridge, without any question. Um, but I inadvertently, I seem to have ended up inventing a communication uh, cloud-based communication platform for engaging patients and providers, which I actually now hold seven patents. So that led to me building a company as a solopreneur to entrepreneur who was working interna an international organization. I worked with both the federal and, um, and commercial businesses, military and civilian, as you've mentioned. And then around when the start of the pandemic came, I kind of went, okay, now what do I do? And uh, as we're building and frankly, getting a little tired of being pestered by investors and my investors and my board, I said, maybe tell it's time to, time to kick in succession. So I stepped back from the day to day, um, still remain on the board and decided to build up my consultancy uh, to do the things I really wanted to do and, and sort of had learned over that pre those previous years. And you know, zeroing in on what I call sort of humanizing digital transformation. Because mm -hmm. everyone, yes, there's a lot of technology, and I was involved in a lot of technology. But what I also saw is that technology is building, but taking up the human factor. Everyone thought, well, the solution is technology. And the reality is technology is an enabler to enable the human side. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so that's kind of where I've been playing up to now. I think that's the way that I look at the future and, and at digitization also, is that I do think that we're going to revert back to the to the mean in that human interaction is going to become more valuable. I think that we've, it's like a pendulum where it's swung yeah. in one direction with social media and all of these other things that have kind of distanced us from each other. Yeah. And then now we're swinging back in the op opposite direction. And I think that that's one of the things, especially in healthcare that I found has been a defining factor for doctors who are popular versus doctors who are not. It's the ability for them to concentrate on their patients and not focus too much on what's on a computer screen, you know? Exactly. It, it's, it's, interesting, it's, interesting, it's interesting, yes, because what these tools and all these tools, and some of them are really cool, but part of our nature is to go to the shiny object and then as opposed to digging behind what's in it. And so what all these shiny objects have done is they talk at us. They don't talk to us. And to your exact point is those, you know, using the doctors, those physicians actually talk to their patients have a completely different experience and particularly for the patient than being talked at and going, okay, you're just another number, you know, they're digit on the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that now because we've swung so far in the opposite direction that 
technology is increasingly being used for human adjuncts in regards to like, you know, AI might make my note taking easier so that I can focus more on having a conversation with my patients. And I, I don't think it's exclusive to healthcare. I think it's, oh, you know, it's every, every, every single organization. Like I think that everybody realizes that face-to-face -face interaction is much more valuable than really any sort of digital. I, that's not true. I, I, I do feel like from a macro perspective, there is a lot of value in like observing trends and, oh, you know, computing absolutely. that kind of data. But I think that there is a there's another component of it where you also have to have this face to face interaction. Oh, absolutely. To, to your point, yes, you can have the data collection so you look at the trends and the insights and sort of where things are going to go. But that's just the data collection number crunching. That's not the core of where this where's the data coming from. And in mm -hmm. order to get the good data, you have to make sure where your data source, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. is in a mode that's actually going to give you real data as opposed to bad data. Mm -hmm. And that's what you mentioned AI, and I've got a whole soap soapbox on AI uh, that uh, I've written about. But in particularly, I, I think where AI is going is terrific. It's also been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. It's just been under different names. You know, mm -hmm. they're calling it AI now, which is a great, you know, phenomenal for marketing and branding. But right now, today, it's still number crunching. All it is is big machines crunching numbers and going, here's the probability of the best response. There's no insight into it. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's the big danger of it all is people thinking, oh, look at all this insight we're getting. No, it's just number crunching working on probabilities. It doesn't have the human side. Eventually, there's no question those elements would be built into it, but we're we're still years away from that. And, mm -hmm. and we were talking earlier about the AI in terms of note taking. Yes, it does note taking, but you still have to, you need the human side to review it mm -hmm. because it doesn't know what it's doing. It just mm -hmm. knows that the math, the boring algorithms are, it knows this word next to this word next to this word, but it doesn't know what those three words mean. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think that the insight is something that human beings will always have a monopoly on. I mean, color me optimistic. I think that, you know, the artificial general intelligence and things like that will just, they're not going to be as capable as human beings. And I, I might be wrong, but I, I tend to think that I'm right. But I think that the numbers crunching, honestly, a lot of our life is numbers crunching, you know, like there's so much yeah. admin work in being a human being in 2023 that yeah. an AI should do, you know, yeah. and I look at that as like a good future, you know, especially, oh, in, absolutely. especially in healthcare. Um, but what are you what are you doing now? I mean, I know that you you know you're you're consulting and you're like how what are you, what are the the issues that you're trying to tackle now? Well, the reality is, and again, it's all timing for for the release of of, of the podcast. But we're days away from a launching a new a new my newest venture hmm. with a Tell new team, which, which is basically we're we're, we're building a virtual healthcare stack. Hmm. Interesting. So it, but but the thing is, it's not just virtual health because reality is. Yes, virtual health is good. Numbers are good. Automating things are good. But again, with my experience and all the, over the years, 93% of the time, man, you could just, it's all routine or you can use different tools to do it all. But 7% of the time, those patients need human interaction. Mm -hmm. so, and, and important, obviously, as you know, di uh, directly. So what this basically does, it ties in, yes, the strongest in automation and in uh, digital tools and access and remote patient monitoring, but it ties in clinical side. So we have call centers. We actually have clinicians that go, can go visit you as an adjunct to working with the providers. You know, we're specializing in the multi-chronic condition population in the States mm -hmm. is where we're going to be starting. We'll be launching with a couple of States, uh, again, depending on the timing of this. We, we will have announced. They're still about to announce. Um, so we have that one component working in the States and doing that. And similarly, we're actually working we just signed our first two contracts uh, actually in the developing world in Africa. Mm. So we're helping to sort of help take them to, you know, accelerate them to where we are, the 5G for lack of a better term, from when they're much more a uh, simpler system. But mm. the beauty of their of working in, in this great case, Africa, is they don't they're not labor, they don't have the problems of the legacy systems that we do and having to work around legacy systems. We're actually going in and building brand new, clean, efficient systems from the start. So there's no bad habits. It's just going straight to being able to outreach the patients. So like, what's your mission? What do you, when you say completely virtual, like how's, how's the care delivered? 
the care it starts with remote either remote patient monitoring or interactions through a communication platform just checking in to see how patients are doing mm -hmm. and depending on the responses you can do regular assessments or depending on how how the algorithms work it actually could tie them directly into a clinician or they can always ask to speak to a clinician mm -hmm. so if it's your annual wellness visit it's one thing if it's a particular condition it's another but really what it does, it uses it to discern the need to bring in human interaction. So it's not eliminating it. It brings it in when it's needed. So everyone's working at the top of their license. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At the same time, for the population that prefer to deal with human interaction, you go straight into human interaction. Yeah. Try yeah. to address the individualness of it all and not put everything into a, a cookie cutter. You know, almost you can describe it as an N of one, mm -hmm. where we're not looking at a big piece. It's, it's each one's an individual. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly think that the convenience aspect of healthcare has not been addressed the way that it needs to be. No. Uh, you know, you just to go to a physician's appointment, you have to call. Oftentimes it's booked out for months. You know, the uh, appointment might change from now until yeah. then. You have to make sure you have to all, get all this paperwork done. Then yeah. even just getting to the clinic, right? Like, yeah. I mean, there's a whole segment of the population that the transportation is a real issue huge, huge issue you know yeah and and then after that like you know you go to the clinic and then and and everything as well but then they might ask you okay you need to do labs you need to do imaging you need to do all this other stuff and to coordinate yeah. all that is just not convenient whatsoever especially if you have not just like your basic run-of-the-mill physical like if you have a chronic condition it yeah. becomes so inconvenient and th that that is i feel like ripe for innovation I, I i i look at it as you know the goal is should be like something like star trek where you know you have the ability to do a complete scan and have a consultation with a doctor that's able to you know do, do it virtually and you don't need to leave the comfort of your own room you know it's yeah. something that you can automatically link up to um with whatever uh, internet service that you have but obviously well, they were Late ways well, from that. Where it, well, and variations were closer than you think. In terms mm -hmm. of that's why I saw the optimism. And quite honest, that was part of the driver that gave me the inspiration for the idea of the communication platform that it came up with. Mm -hmm. Star it, Trek? It, or what, so, uh, well, Star Trek, without any question, I like, you know, that you know, original series onward. Yeah. Um, but um, it was because, again, so the, the quick tie between film production and healthcare is mm -hmm. I expanded my company from doing traditional film. Mm -hmm. In education and training, my first clients were continuing medical education and GlaxoSmithKline dealing with type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. where I kind of learned about chronic conditions and the issues associated with chronic conditions. And the difficulties, as you mentioned, travel being one of the big ones. This is, again, 2005 when we're reading, I was reading about this. And I said, well, why can't you reach once? Instead of having patient, telling patients how to communicate and you've got to do this, what if you had put the control in the hands of the patients? Let them mm -hmm. determine how they want to communicate, you know, mm -hmm. text, email, interactive voice, chat, whatever you want to do. And also from the comfort of their home. Mm -hmm. That was the, that was my thesis statement of what built my company and got me into healthcare was mm -hmm. doing all that. And that was the inspiration. What supercharged it all was working with the VA um, as one of my first clients. We had this amazing group where we worked with the uh, women's health group out of Sacramento, California. And it was combat trained female vets suffering from post-traumatic stress, stress who were pregnant. Mm. And there was at that time, there were a thousand women in that circumstance every day. And mm. at the time there was a 78% probability of a suicidal event. Yeah. Not, not to success necessarily, but a suicidal event. And the, just the results of what we, I, we, we built, you know, my goofy idea, but my team built in this program were, prior to use, using our system, um, basically had 25 vets to each clinician to manage them. Once the program was up and running, the clinician was managing 150 women. Each mm -hmm. one thought they were getting better care. And the, the biggest honor is during the time everyone was on my program, there was not one successful uh, suicidal vet wow. during that time. That's pretty amazing. And the key to it was Yes, we're automating a lot of the assessments that you're talking about, but they didn't have to come to the office. They could stay when they're 150 miles away or 100 miles away or even 50 miles away and then have the capability of going in with kids already to mm -hmm. go to the facility. Yeah, you know, I, I think it works really well with 
mental health. I think it works really well with therapy. Um, I'm, I wonder how well it would work for other, uh, specific, more specific, uh, analyses like the sensor technology, like you can get a good pulse ox, you can get a good EKG, but mm -hmm. I don't know if it's like, like we don't have like a full body scan that's going to replace a physical exam. No, yet. and no, and I don't think, and it's a long time and to your point, it's a long time before we, you have a full body scan, but I there's, so. I mean, things. I think that, I think oh. that, I think that, I think that like a CT scan and a MRI are maybe not equivalent to a, a physical exam, but they certainly are very, uh, oh, I'm sorry. you know, I, like, I, was, I was taking it to the hologram, I was taking it to the hologram world. We just stand gotcha. there. Yeah. 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 Convenience. No. Work, yeah. Convenience. We don't no, have, you no, know, but the tools, oh, the tools are absolutely there. Like the CT scans yeah. and MRIs are amazing. Yeah. They pull up and, you know, 3d imaging of every of different body parts. Mm -hmm. It is phenomenal. So yes, the toys are there, but they're big. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, at some exactly. point, they've got to shrink down. And it yeah. does come down to the algorithms. Like, you know, because everything, it's all inputting information. And mm -hmm. it goes down to the fundamental to all these things and like technology is how good is the data? Mm -hmm. Because that's, that's really what it all comes down to. And I, I'm certainly not a data geek at all. But I do know what you need is good data because you, if you, unless you have the good data to start with, it's not going to help. And good data is not just having a pulse oximeter, for example, and mm -hmm. getting stuff off of that. And you know, mm -hmm. probably you know ninety nine point six percent of the time you can get good data on there. It's you've got what you've got. Half the solution is the toys mm -hmm. and what you hook people up to. The other half is you got to ask the patient. Patient generated mm -hmm. data, which becomes yeah. more the holy grail because it's not standardized in any real form. Yeah. But yeah. you need both pieces to get the whole person. And that's to me is in terms of, you know, help in terms of, yes, get the full body scan at home in the hologram, but also you also have to know how the person feels because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that becomes a whole different parameter. Mm -hmm. Like we did, we did early work with uh, wearables in terms of collecting data with that and using that. And everyone said, well, wearables are how reliable are they? This is obviously a few years ago. But many of the wearables, even though they're 15% off or 22% off, whatever the case may be, they were really good at being off the same amount all the time. So it was, it was a, let's say it was early Fitbit, and I'm making the number up. Let's say it was off 10% of the time. It was always off 10% of the time. So the valuable data really is not how many steps did they take. The valuable data is how much change was there in the number of steps that they took. Right, right, it's right. more valuable as information. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. I think that that's something that the data doesn't necessarily need to be accurate, but or precise, but it does need to be accurate in regards to exactly. the data. Um, so I would be remiss. We kind of touched on it a little bit. I mean, I don't get to talk to people very often who are uh, have kind of like this interesting trajectory. Usually it's to get into this field and to get into science and futurism, like you have to have a very dogmatic path. And so um, you touched on your time in uh, film and and television, and we also touched on science fiction. One of the biggest inspirations for me and what I do, and, and honestly, most of my interest in futurism has come from science fiction. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, number one, is that also the case for you, or is this something that that uh, that you you've just kind of gotten to just from another pathway? No, I, 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 you know, as I think about it, I certainly, there's no question that that was an element because I've always watched science fiction. I really enjoyed it. You know, I read it. I wasn't, you know, I was a Ray Bradbury, you know, voracious reader, um, but it's definitely science fiction, science fiction films were what of interest to me as a, depending how, how science fictionist that you think it may be, I was also involved in the production of a small thing called Robocop. Oh, really? So get out of here. So it was. I love uh, Robocop. So it was kind of, you know, I, 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 I danced in some of that, you know, that kind of world, but it was always yeah. fascinating to me. Like I was always really interested in, in all those things. So I think though overtly never looked at, it, I think there's no question it played into what I do, you know, in terms of, you know, reading. Yes, I do a lot of online, but I still get Discover Magazine. I still get Smithsonian. I still get the actual magazines and I'm a voracious, popular mechanics. Like I'm a voracious yeah. reader just of what all these, these things are. Right, right, yeah. No, so just s small tangent on on RoboCop. Frank Miller uh, was the yeah. one who developed the the intellectual property, and yeah, I, I think that 
I really like him a lot because he oftentimes shows a dystopian future, but I would under, say, yeah. underneath the dystopian future is this element of like, we're going to, we're going to make it better as human beings. We're, we're going to make it better. And I think he yeah. like, there's so much dystopia that's out there in science fiction, but yeah. there's a lot of utopia too. I mean, you know, Star Trek being one of them, which is one of the things that I highlighted, but like every, there's always an element of like the best that we could achieve also, yeah. you know? And that's, that's one of the things that I really like. And, um, and I, I really do like Robocop a lot, especially just like the idea of bringing cyborgs to the mainstream. I can't think of anybody else that did it better or did it earlier. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's certainly one of the ones that seemed the most, but that was that interface made it the most human for mm -hmm. obvious reasons and how they did right. that. But it really yeah. brought it to, oh, okay, it's not, you know, my favorite robot from, from Lost in Space. You right. Know, in terms of, it was like, or Hal, which is the other side, the direct. Right, right. You know, but same the, thing, right? Like like Stanley Kubrick had this dystopian version of like this yeah. AI that, that went crazy. But like, man, the future was so beautiful in that, you know? Yeah. And and I, that's one of the things that I really love just like as an art piece is retrofuturism like what what did the people from the 60s think that the future was going to look like mm -hmm. it's always sleek it's always beautiful and you know I, I i feel like right now there's a lot of people that are trying to make that happen like uh you know for better or for worse the the cyber truck is is elon musk's attempt to do that and you know he it was an answer to a conversation that he had with his kid his kid saying like why do the cars not look like the cars in the future from the movies right yeah and uh and i think that the, that that kind of trend is happening which is really exciting it's like a really exciting time i think to be a human being everybody i think knows that we're on this exponential growth curve you know the changes yeah. are happening unlike anything that we've ever really experienced before and yeah, obviously sort of, you've experienced it too i mean especially with your non-traditional path right yeah well it's moore's law on on steroids in terms of just how exponentially increases exactly. in terms right. of uh, yeah in, in terms of how this comes together, but it is interesting, you know, in terms of the past influence in the future, just using example, Elon Musk, who said, well, in the past, they said trucks are going to look like this. So that's what gonna, it's going to look like today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, it's funny, but the inspiration for me, what everyone always thought the future looked like was a movie called Logan's Run. I yeah. I remember that run. So yeah. everyone's right. sort of white and bald. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, for some reason, everyone thought that was going to be the future, that hair was a real problem. I guess. <laughs> so, and, and the reality is, it's but but it becomes interesting because I'm also fascinated by history. So, like, we go through all the things that we're doing, this is all cool, and going, well, no one's ever experienced it. But the reality is, is every moment in history, everyone thought that their moment, you know, and I'm talking about everyone, but in many cases for the past 200 years, let's say, that mm -hmm. this is it. Look at all this technology that we have. Look at all these things and how things are changing. Mm -hmm. now, no question, the speed at which that's happening is dramatic which is great, but it's also, you know, the, which is the utopian side. The dystopian side is it can be go sideways so easily mm -hmm. because as a human, as a human animal, a lot of this is almost too much to comprehend yeah. unless it's fed properly. Right. Right. And I use, you know, I use, let's use chat GPT as an example. Again, and, and my, you know, statement, I think AI and all the approach to that brand of doing that, I think is great. And there's a tremendous amount of value it has, it's going to have for us, but right. you've got to know what you need. Like for chat GPT, for example, part of the programming was you always have to have an answer mm -hmm. regardless whether it knows the answer or not. So it was programmed to make up answers. Mm -hmm. So unless you know, when you're going to using chat GPT in your browser, whatever the case may be, that the answer you get may or may not be the right answer. Mm -hmm. You have to have another let you got to ask it to give sources. You got to sort of know what those guard where the guardrails are. Yeah. So What's it's, that blanket, that... it's that blanket acceptance of things is going. Yeah. You know, and maybe always having a bit because I've always had this. Yes, I, I'm obviously very much the future looks great and a lot of opportunity, but I've also gone with a cynical look as well, going, yes, but we got to be careful because it can go sideways. Yeah. What's interesting with the chat GPT when you ask it to give sources is that it makes up the sources too. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting to me. Like yeah. the, the hallucinations of yeah. giving you something that it like wants me to hear, you know, yeah. Yeah. Or, or feels like I want to hear. So for example, like if I were to say, Hey, write me a, a research article with sources about X, yeah. it would write that research article and it would totally make up sources. Yeah. It looks really good. 
Looks yeah, and it looks good. great. It looks yeah. it looks great. It's it, it looks so great that it has fooled uh lawyers, you yes. know, lawyers that have, have inputted that and put it into their and, their cases and, and have got caught out. And have and have got called out for that. Yeah. So but it's I think that that's that's really that's really funny to me is that um the the, the hallucination thing is just it, it's such a weird byproduct. Like who, who would have thought that that would be a problem? You know? Well, exactly. And so that's why the tough part is, is, is knowing what the, in which we can't do. We don't know how the, who was the coder, what kind of coding did they do? What were the parameters of the coding that they had? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's, there's no way. And if you look on, you know, if you go you know online to see, well, how many chat AI bots are out there? I'd say it's probably about 300 right now. Mm -hmm. And so how do you know how it's all programmed and everything else? So it's more just look at it as an enable, not as a solution, all these things as solutions, not an, or as an enablers, not solutions and go, okay, this gives you some parameters. So it's almost like we touched on earlier. It's like, it gives you a good first draft of all sorts of things. But then our job on the, as a human animal side is, okay, now we got to build on that. Let's check this out. But it's a great start on some pieces. Someone was telling me on another podcast session that was a a um, an expert in AI that the the biggest thing for him that he's seeing is the ability to code in general oh. has dropped down significantly. It's, it's crazy. Now, have, it's crazy and I know that you're you're actually like building something out yourself right now. I, I'm sure that you probably are in it with that whole. Um, software stack or have you noticed has that translated to to real difference now or is that something that's coming down the pipeline oh no it's it's happening now if you'll be reading if you haven't read already about uh in in the gaming industry mm. you know hundreds if not thousands of coders being fired mm. let go because you just you just have like which one is it is it gtp design which one it was it was so insane you actually just showed in the picture Here's the here's the diagram of what I want, and say this is what I want. Here's the output, and I want it in Python, one of the computer languages. And in seconds, it gave the entire coding for the entire interaction set that you showed as just the, as just as your sketch. Wow. No, no, you have to again. You need to have somebody to, to now check all the lot the coding, but it's now taken the work of five people. In, yeah. you know three weeks like whatever, whatever the case may be so no that is real time mm -hmm. and depending what you want you go i want to go from python to c plus plus another computer language and it'll just change it for you mm -hmm. the reality is everything's going to python so it's switch shifting all that way mm -hmm. no the son is a systems engineer and he's just telling you know telling me some of it all and my my programmers are telling me what's going on and it's 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 amazing what it's doing but it's having real-time effect today like the, yeah. the price where coding used to be, a programmer used to be a high priced uh, area. Salaries are dropping just because, look, we need senior, senior people now. And we've got machines that can take care of it really quickly for yeah. us. Which I, I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. Honestly, I felt like, especially for a lot of the applications that I feel like I want to have, mm -hmm. the barrier to entry to coding is so significant that it it it's like it's kind of disheartening. Like I, I feel like like I, you know, if I said, hey, I want an app that is able to connect my um my education courses so that I can you know, distribute them online. Like I have to go out and I have to find a developer and like it, yeah. you know they might they might make a stack it might take me like you know three or four months. The yeah. the idea of democratizing it, I think that that's interesting to me. I think that oh, that's yeah. that that would allow for a, a whole other sector of the population to get into entrepreneurship with coding. Yeah. Whereas now it's, it's sort of, you know, they, they look at it as like this really democratic field and like, you know, really open to everybody, but it's also very difficult, you know, it's extremely it's, difficult. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not, it's not like, you know, the early two thousands where I could learn how to build a website. And then all of a sudden, you know, I, that transitioned that into a fortune 500 company, right? Yeah. It's, you have to learn a lot to get through that. And yeah, not everybody has the time for that. I certainly don't have the time. Yeah, for no, I, I completely agree. Well, it's, it's analogous completely to the film, film television business mm. where the advent of digital, when anybody with a, a phone 
can actually make, you know, whatever they want to make. And you have a tool on your laptop to do all the editing and you can push that out. That's changed. It's changed yeah. it all. And, you know, a, a great example, if you've ever known the show, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Well, it. you know, the pilot was done on an iPhone. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. They used an iPhone. I think it was a four, but they literally shot it on an iPhone. They edited it on one of the tools that existed on their computer and submitted it. Hmm. So, wow. So to your point, you can't get more democratization, democratization than that. Now, the fundamental issue is a lot of garbage get created. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, you know, reality is democracy is messy. So in terms of doc- democratization, that sits the, 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 sits it all perfectly. But it's a way for people to find things. You know, there's gems that are hidden that don't have access. It goes back to actually to our earlier discussion in terms of access. It's allowing access to things that you didn't have access to before. Yeah. I'd love to hear your insight, considering your background on everything that's going on with the film and television industry right now and how they're trying to push back against AI, number one, but also the the decrease of legacy media and how it's just really not important. I think that with all of the different technological advances that it makes less sense for us to have you know these large organizations that are kind of the 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 arbiters of all the content that comes out um but i might be wrong i'm I'm, I'm, how do you feel about it it's it's tough having you know when i was you know grown up when i grown up when i was very young on tv you had three channels Exactly. Yeah. And it was sort of like that was actually two to start with. Because I think that was good, later I, on. Which, honestly, which, that's a good thing. It was, well, it was a really good thing because you had a shared consciousness of the population. Yeah. So when yeah. Ed Sullivan was on, you know, CBS and the CBS on Sunday night, you know, to date me and everybody who's listening to this, um, it was a shared consciousness. You know, everyone, you know, I was, I was very young when the Beatles came on, but the Beatles are on or before my time, Elvis. It's just like it was a very shared consciousness, and there's something to that mm-hmm. as a as a society. You know, with mm-hmm. the fragmentation, the problem is in destination television or destination programming now. It mm-hmm. it sort of changed how those how those pieces. You don't have that shared consciousness anymore, which mm-hmm. I think is a value in terms of it's just something that you know is an experience. Yeah. So having it all out there now, the problem is when you've got the media stacks that exist now. Perfect example. It can be used for like you know good. Or it can be used for very specific purposes. It all mm-hmm. depends on what, and they have the ability still with mass media to control certain things. They have mm-hmm. considerably less control than they used to in the, mm-hmm. in that for the same reason. Mm-hmm. Whether it's good or not, it's 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 a tough call. It's kind of like if you're producing something that's a value, sure. Like in terms of, like for example, like for me, I'm a big BBC person for the news. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. where I get I watch the BBC for the news. Great mm-hmm. source of news. So that's my news stack. Mm-hmm. For you know TV, it's picking and choosing. There's some of the stuff on Hulu I'll watch. You know, there's stuff on Apple. And, you know, in terms of it, it becomes more of a shopping, but it's it's going to Wegmans. Exactly. You know, exactly. And, oh, I'm gonna get a little bit on that shelf, a little bit on this shelf. Right, right. It's, it's yeah. changed the nature, so it's changed the economics. Yeah. And so, to your point, so it's changed a lot of how in you know how production is done, and the solution that the studios have done at production to look at film is events. Mm-hmm. Well, everything's an event. We're going to go through the entire DC catalog. Everything's going to be a superhero. Mm-hmm. The problem is, it's you know great. Well, you know what? People are kind of tired of it now. Yeah, it's got it's gotten a little stale. So you have a film like Oppenheimer and a film like Barbie in you know, this past summer that actually got tremendous because it was actually different, mm-hmm. and it wasn't yeah. this big superhero thing. And and they got a great rating. You know, a lot of people showed up for them because they want that change. So the problem is the big machines, those big conglomerates of media, it's run, you know, my alma mater out by MBAs. Um, and look at looking at the numbers, not looking at the human side of it. Mm-hmm. So you're going, oh, statistically, this, this, okay. We put 200, you know, the mathematics of film is very simple. For every 10 films that are made, eight are going to lose a stupid amount of money. One's going to break even. And one's going to be a massive hit. Mm-hmm. The problem is they have no idea which ones. Mm-hmm. So it's just throwing the stuff at the wall. And so what they're trying to do is to narrow it. So, okay, well, these big superhero movies, more of them make more money than the uh, smaller ones. So we'll do that. 
Yeah. But, I I think that it's interesting now how also a lot of these companies are are becoming much more lifestyle brands. Like if you have like Disney Plus, like you're a Disney family, you know, yes. or like yeah. Apple is like an identity now, which yeah. that's that's an interesting trend for I, I wouldn't even say it's media. I would just say it's like companies in general, you know. Everything's everything's brand management. Everything's become yeah. a brand. Yeah, news yeah. has become a brand. But the the old networks are that way. Like NBC kind of had its own brand. ABC had its own kind of brand. Right. right. Yeah. You know, yeah. CBS had it, but it was different. It was much more esoteric. Where now it's much more specific. Right. The, right. the biggest problem is you're throwing so much media at people, or so many things, is and they're you're getting everyone's overwhelmed. Yeah. And that's yeah. the bigger problem is you're overwhelming people and everything. And yeah. everything, everything is, you know, you go in every news station on TV, everything is breaking news. Like mm-hmm. shows are called breaking news. It's kind of like you can't, you know, how do you discern? And so the, it's the the difficulty is to be able to discern. Mm-hmm. Like I use this example a lot. You know, I'm not the only one with Google. Is when, and, you know, you know, everyone would go and have something wrong with them. Dr. Google would tell you what's wrong. What people didn't realize is they go into Google, the people, 95% of people looked at the first three search items and that was it and took them for gospel mm-hmm. without trying to figure out why are those the first three items, what's behind those first three items, mm-hmm. but didn't care. They sort of said, okay, that's that's the answer to my problem. Yeah. And, th- and people are manipulating the search engine algorithms to sell snake oil in a lot of cases with healthcare. Yeah. Which is well, it must drive you crazy as a doctor. You have, you have yeah, patients yeah, come yeah. in, patients come in going, Well, I, I, <laughs> I just Googled this and I think I've, I think I've got an arrhythmia or mm-hmm. I've got this problem or I saw yeah. this drug. I saw this drug on TV and late night TV. I, I think I got that problem. I've got male pattern baldness and I take this and shake it in my head so I can grow up with an afro tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. My biggest thing right now is that people are, are getting into this uh, uh, idea that titanium which is a very common metal that we use to oh, yeah. surgical fixation yeah. is uh is not good for them that's something that is like a recent thing that i've Where that? I, I hadn't heard that where i've heard many crazy things i hadn't heard that one yeah no it's it's i i don't think it's real but no. i have a lot of, like it, it's just it, you know like every now and then you like an idea permeates through from multiple different sources and yeah. I've had like two or three patients like in the past six months that have asked me about like either removing their titanium or that they didn't want to get titanium. And really? so that was, that was something that was interesting to me. Um, and that, so I changed, little... that changed hip replacement. We want wood, carve, <laughs> so, car, carve some wood or something. So there are ceramic hip replacements, but I mean, overwhelmingly titanium has been used, yeah. for, you know, for yeah. literally decades. But yeah. my point is, is that, you know, it's, it's just interesting to have like this other view where you're not exposed to something, you have this this uh, normal protocol that you follow, and then all of a sudden, idea comes from Google, from you know some sort of snake oil, and uh, and then it permeates into your your little bubble, right? Like yeah. that's 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 an interesting concept for me, because yeah. Yeah. you know, like right. it, it's it, you wouldn't expect it. It's like I I wouldn't expect someone trying to convince me that the earth is flat but over the past few years like i've met people that have this idea that the, the earth is flat you know very few people and like you know they're they're not like you know close personal friends but i've definitely met people yeah. like out in the community that that believe that um i didn't think i don't think that that existed like 10 years ago you know these no, ideas, it's yeah it just well, it goes, yeah, well it's interesting but it goes to your point in terms of and it, it it it's a a social issue back to the dystopian side mm-hmm. because of the bump, it, the two things, social media and all this technology is to sort of find like-minded people mm-hmm. is really what social media has done. Mm-hmm. You know, so at the extreme, I got this whack job idea and thought, and all of a sudden, Oh, there's another person, the same whack job thought. And they, they start building on each other and it could be a thought, but they start going, well, this must be real because these 10 other people have that same idea. Mm-hmm. And so they build upon themselves. Mm-hmm. And, but it's, you know, years from now, psychologists will look back and hopefully explain some of it. But it's this bizarre desire to to bond with somebody mm-hmm. and bond with his ideas. Like to you know, to your point, the flat Earth. I won't go into it, but I agree with you; it's not flat. Um, but, <laughs> I, 
<laughs> it, it, it gives you any comfort. It gives you any comfort. I'm yeah. agreeing with you. Yeah. Yeah. It, but yeah, it's I, amazing how people want, but it's, it's, I don't know if they believe it or not. It's they want mm-hmm. to believe it. Yeah. It's like it becomes a mini religion. So mm-hmm. My religion is there's a flat earth and as a result of the flat earth, X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. And it, it's a really weird phenomenon, but social media and technology has enabled that and amped it up. And obviously it's in the stories, but again, the algorithms in the, in the social media programs and platforms um, that really push that further. And it becomes really, it's a, it's an interesting phenomena. I'm not sure, you know, it, it's a good one um, because it's, you know, you're accelerating just really, you know, non-fact based or scientifically fact based ideas and letting it fester when it's benign like that, because, you know, in every, you know, you sort of say, yeah, Joe over there believes the earth's flat. It's not funny, but when it gets amped up and you're talking about the environment that we're in today, it can go, you know, where, how wrong can it go? Yeah, I, I think that um, one of the conversations that I had with somebody the other day that was an interesting point that they were saying that this is just like the next round of evolution. Like for, for a, such a long time, genetics were an issue. And so if you were born with uh, like, you know, some sort of random genetic disease, then you would be weeded out of the gene pool. And yeah. your progeny would not propagate. Uh, now we have a lot of tools that help those people succeed, and 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 as they should, you know, they mm-hmm. have a right to life the same way that we yeah. do. But the ideas concept, you know, the likelihood that that person is going to convince somebody else that the Earth is flat, and so much so that they'll actually get married and have children, is unlikely. Know. And I was like, wow, that's so interesting. I wonder if that's the case that like, you know, maybe a hundred years we're looking from now that like, you know, idea of evolution will just be a, the, from coming from ideas and that the people who have the most correct ideas, which is like, you know, natural physics and, and you know, science and everything like that, those will be the people who will be most likely to succeed. It's like a, a new version of natural selection. But anyway, it's something that I, I thought about. It, it is fascinating. No, you're absolutely right. It is fascinating. And it just, yeah, we're so early days on what that means. Mm-hmm. You yeah. Because you see, you're seeing now a bit of a divide in society between those who believe certain things and don't believe certain things. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll go so far to both, you know, bold to say there's those who believe in fact based you know, mm-hmm. provable scientifically based product and those who go, yeah, but I don't, I don't think that's right. Mm-hmm. So it's just because I don't think it, then I'm, then that's must be my fact. Mm-hmm. I, and, I, I think that the, the, the 2016 era when people were introduced to the idea of alternative facts yeah. is when we really like made a, a, a break with like, how accurate you had to be with what you were saying is correct, you know, and, and that's, that's an interesting thing, but, you know, politics aside, I did want to talk with um, you a little bit about your military work, which is something that I think that is, is super interesting. I didn't get an opportunity to talk with you about it, but uh, tell me a little bit more about your time with the VA and, and the defense department and all of that other stuff. Well, really we, we started, with um, my first trial of the technology, the platform I talked about, was mm-hmm. actually with an NGO working with a gentleman who were suffering from post-traumatic stress and mild uh, traumatic brain injury at a convalescent group called Pathway Homes out in Sacramento, in uh, the Napa Valley, mm-hmm. in Yountville. And it was really fascinating work to work with them because they had short-term memory issues and everything else. And we in helping them to sort of use my technology to be, help interact with them. And that trial was really successful. In fact, literally, you know, two, two weeks into the first trial, I got a call at midnight because I was in Eastern time zone and it was nine o'clock in even their time. And a friend Guzman called me up and said, Howard, I just called to let you know you say your technology helped save a life tonight. And, and he hung up the phone. And so, of course, I called him right back. And I was swearing at him, it must be a half an hour, just every word you can do, because I was still producing film at the time. This was a side piece. And he said, why, why are you so mad? He said, because you don't understand, Fred. 
So this I thought was a kind of cool technology and neat idea. You know, certainly business good. Kind of thought, yes, there's a social good, but never did I think there would be something that can actually help save somebody or help support them. So how now I've got to do this. How can I not? I got to find a way to do this again. I got to see if I can help one more person or those won't sleep nights and mm -hmm. quit the film business to do this all the time. So I became evangelical about it. And some of the clinicians who worked there then went to other facility, uh, VA facilities and they start talking about it in these VA facilities. And so that's how I got into the VA was through that and worked uh, our main center. We worked in Sacramento with the Women's Health, but also at North Chicago and at the James Lovell facility. And there we worked with, we had all kinds of work and papers that came out of that, uh, working with uh, high-risk suicidal, um, obviously met a traumatic brain injury. To your point earlier, huge in mental health and behavioral health and working with you know all the gentlemen and women in terms of dealing with it all and pushing the envelope in terms of what we can get, what we can do, because it was not the traditional care process. So head office was looking at us as scans, whereas the facilities are going, no, no, let's keep on going. Mm -hmm. And while we did that, we had an opportunity to work with the Department of Defense when we got asked to work with their um, program called Military One Source which is really the wellness ongoing care management for active duty personnel. So where the VA is retired, that was active duty. And, and to be working with them really was more catch all to sort of say, do you have a, an issue? Let's follow up, let's find, make sure you're being taken care of. So what it really was used to, show, to do was if somebody said, I have a problem, whatever the problem could be, they used our system to automate follow up and to make sure that they were getting followed up if they weren't create an outreach to make sure it was taken care of. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of, because you, you had the front lines taking care of people, and this took to your earlier point, this did all the follow-up side, which is amazingly administratively heavy. Yeah. yeah. Which is what got me interested in creating rudimentary versions of what's now called uh, robot, robotic process automation, RPA. I don't know if you've heard, heard of that yet. I have, yeah. Yeah. which is something I'm very much involved in, which is where you have chat GPT as an example of where a patient can speak to or get information through an automated assistant. Mm -hmm. RPA is the behind the scenes assistant working with phys physicians and clinicians. Right. Right. So Doing so, admin work that, you know, like, like putting in insurances it, and stuff like that, you know, it's doing insurances or knowing if you got, you got your, it, it does a look for instance, it has your schedule for tomorrow for Monday. And mm -hmm. it says, okay, it knows you're seeing Sarah James. It'll know, it, you know, based on the programming, it'll go search out for any updates in Sarah James's history throughout the entire health system. Mm -hmm. So if they had any tests, any bloods, any, any, if they've done any prescriptions, whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. update the record and do an analysis based on your parameters to sort of say, okay, based on this kind of change or these elevated levels, you should look at this, this, and this. So when you have your 15 minutes with Sarah, it's not mm -hmm. asking all the questions and it's not even you querying about, you know, wonder if this could be this or this. It's already done that work to help trigger your discussion. Mm -hmm. And in terms of efficiency and effectiveness, it's it's phenomenal. How do you measure efficiency and effectiveness? Effic well, efficiency is the information that's there um, and the ability to track the, inf the information down. And if it's not there to figure ways in, in alerting to be able to track the information down. So if yeah. something doesn't is something where something is wrong, it'll highlight that right away. So if efficiency is just it, it's all the information is there. And in terms of the FTEs, the full time staff, is it allows administration to do the things you know much more productively than mm -hmm. some of these much more you know rudimentary tasks of just following information or searching. We're going on searching different databases all the time, like sitting at the keyboard trying to track right. things down. It had as automatic automatically does all those systems. Yeah, that's that's pretty interesting, and I I, th I do think it's going to be very important in the healthcare field because there's just so much admin work. Um, yeah. But listen, I, I'd love to talk to you more, but we're coming towards the end of our time, and at the end of our time, I always ask all of my guests three questions that I haven't been able to ask them that I was thinking about, and a, a lot of them are, are similar to other questions that I've asked other guests in the past. The first of which is, where do you see healthcare in ten years? Like, what do you what do you hope that would happen, such that it's a future that you're excited about? Well, I think there's two things to that one is you've heard about digital health, e health, mobile health. Um, 
is to get out of that and just call it health. Mm-hmm. It's just health. It's just healthcare. It doesn't you don't, you don't need to give a name to it? You don't need to give a name to a piece to it. It's just healthcare. It's how we're helping people. Mm-hmm. Is the first part. The second part is I think, and I think we touched on it earlier. It's more into the what I call well, what you hear about is precision medicine. So the care I'm getting today is not okay. Well, here's a checklist of things. Um, it's actually tuned to my needs. It's tuned to my body chemistry. It's tuned to my genomics. It's tuned to what actually is happening to me. If I'm walking, you know, if I'm sleeping four hours a night, it's not considered a problem because that's better than the three hours a night I had for 50 years. Mm-hmm. You know? It's just known. It's it's normal as opposed to somebody else would be considered abnormal. So it's you're not. Did you really only sleep for three hours a night? Is that a real thing? Did did yeah. Oh wow, jeez. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm, I'm now I'm up to four and a half. Five. Oh my god. Yeah. So wow, you have so much energy. I'm, I'm exhausted. I mean, I'm you know, it's just like you know. No, but like you're <laughs> I've the, had half my day. I had a friend of mine going, man? In, in university. I had a friend of mine who slept ten hours a day. So oh he used to god. joke, "I've lived twice his life." <laughs> wow. But it, but it's so. But, but that's where I think it's all going to be going in 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 those areas in terms of much more specific, much more tuned to uh, our particular needs, because mm-hmm. that's how you get real care. That's where where real care. And, you know, it goes beyond my, fr- you know, frustration, just a personal example, something weird showed up in one of my x-rays, you know, main reason I thought was because it just had better x-ray systems than, you know, before, but you know, it was really concerned. So I had a year's worth of tests and at the end of the day, 51% was negative, 49% was positive. So I went, okay, I guess you're negative. Uh, let us know if it hurts and then come in again. It would get us out of that kind of healthcare and into actually knowing much more in depth, the information as opposed to the art of health versus the science of health. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, you know, the, the trouble with too many tests is that there's so many false negatives, false positives, exactly artifacts and, and all all sorts of different things, you know? And so until we get accuracy and precision that's on, you know, the, the atomic level almost, I feel like it's going to, it's going to be a lot of that for a long time. Yeah, uh, but there's no question. But yeah, no, but, but no, absolutely. But I said part of the problem is is because the the testing is getting so accurate and so clean. Like using X rays, an example, the digital X rays or the three D digital X rays are so much better than even ten years ago. Mm-hmm. Things are showing up that never showed up before, mm-hmm. and for those things showing up are raising flags as opposed to you know what it may have existed my entire life. Mm-hmm. We just mm-hmm. don't know. So it's creating this whole X. So the good thing is. You're getting more accurate pieces of information. The bad news is, it's like it's raising all kinds of flags, and I'm not the only person that's happened to because oh my gosh, something's showing up that didn't show up before. Mm-hmm. You know, reasons why it didn't show up. So uh, we talked a little bit about science fiction and its impact in your life. What would you say is some really significant and impactful science fiction that has affected us as a species? That's interesting. I really, and maybe it's just, it, it's just because it shows age. I really do think Star Trek was probably one of the biggest influences mm-hmm. on a lot of people. Because, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you know, certainly looking at it now, it looks quaint. You know, it was kind of, it was sort of, you know, the idea of like, for example, when you went, like the whole idea when Kirk would go through the door and the door would automatically open and close, mm-hmm. it was mind boggling. People went, oh my gosh, how did this happen? The reason it was so relatable to a lot of people, um, which is why it's so valuable, because Gene Roddenberry actually spoke with NASA scientists and all scientists around the world when he developed the show to say what's coming up in the next 20 to 30 years. Mm-hmm. So he mm-hmm. built all those things in knowing what was coming. So mm-hmm. to me, it kind of opened up ideas of this is actually near term, not that thought it was near term, but these things are approachable, reachable. Mm-hmm. And, and the future is, you know, it put it provided a vision of the future that wasn't Mad Max. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very. And, and it was very hopeful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, post scarcity society. You know, we've moved past money as yeah. a as a denomination of value. A lot of great things that I hope that come to fruition. Um, so, you know, touching on that, my last question is: healthcare aside, what is a technology that you want to have happen that you're really looking forward to. I'll tell you mine. Mine is robots. I can't wait until I have a robot butler that waters my plants, that folds my laundry. Um, I just, I really can't wait until all of the menial tasks of 
being uh, a parent, <laughs> to be quite honest with you, because I have a two-year-old. Oh, wow. Like, yeah. So I yeah. uh, can't wait uh, until those are taken care of for me. Yeah. you got fun ahead still. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. Oh, it's great. I've had, I've had four. So I've. Uh... Oh, good for you. That's my perfect number. I, if I could, you know, we're, we're, me and my wife are in negotiations right now about numbers, but. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's I, awesome. I, so was, so was I. <laughs> Did but you, it's, uh... Yeah. So what, what, what would you say is your, is the technology that you're most looking at? forward to that's actually really interesting i think in terms of it is the amped up version of the digital assistants mm -hmm. we're really using sort of say instead of saying alexa or google or whatever the case may be but really to sort of gather information and put it to, to put it together or to to in part to do what you want i said oh damn i forgot to water the lawn can you set the sprinklers on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's yeah. more just to have that extra support system to sort of go to do some of the things and, and gather the information Right. Or me right. be able to do or whatever the case may be to do what I want to do. Yeah. Yeah. It is, I, I, it, it, is an autom it, it is an automated dr like driverless cars because that scares me. Oh, yeah. It, it scares me. Wait until we have automated drivers. Well, That's 30, 30 minutes of like, you know, free time. But, but it only, yes, but it can't happen until it's all driverless cars. Like it can't be hybrids. Hybrid have humans. So you got to be kidding me. Like the idea to think you have an algorithm that can figure who's going to do a whack job turn, it's not going to happen. Yeah. yeah. So if it's all driverless, without question, that'd be the coolest thing. Mm -hmm. But as long as you got people, humans driving, yeah, it's going to be, you're going to have accidents. Yeah. Yeah. I, and certainly a lot more safety uh, and, and efficiency when everything is connected in general. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I can't wait until I have an assistant that I can say, hey, book me a flight for this time and, uh, or for this day. You know, it already knows my schedule. Well, that's just it knows the schedule, knows what you like, knows what you like, window or whatever. And you want to have a certain right. seat preference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that'd be very cool. And it, it can actually do it. Yeah. Well, listen, it was so nice speaking with you, Howard. Uh, all the best of luck in your new venture. And to all of our listeners, please like and subscribe. And we will see you in the future. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you so much. We appreciate you taking part in today's episode. Take this chance to reimagine a better future by joining a community of futurists who strive for a remarkable world. Be a part of this growing network and contribute to making the world a more positive place. Visit thefuturistsociety.net and subscribe to the show so you don't miss a drop of hopeful futurism.